Um, this has turned out to be a lot of fun and <laughs> worked surprisingly well. And we're really excited to have Vic Reiner here with us today. Um, so Vic got his PhD in 1990 at MIT. Um, he was a student of Richard Stanley. And he's been at the University of Minnesota Twin Sitter Cities ever since. He's interested in algebraic, geometric, and topological combinatorics. We'll see some of that today. Although mostly he likes to count things. Um, so recently his interests have circled back to one of his first loves, invariant theory and finite groups, particularly reflection groups. He does a ton of editorial work on the editorial boards of JCTA, algebra and number theory, and the new Fair Open Access Journal um, of Algebraic Combinatorics. He's also mentor mentored just an astonishing number of students, um, well over 100, ranging from undergraduates through postdocs. This is a new journal um, journal. So like the output. One of the um, wonderful things about hosting is that Bill and I get kind of sneak previews of presenters' slides, and this is going to be a just a wonderful talk. I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you so much, Vic. Take it away. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks, Joe. I, I really want to thank uh, both both uh, Bill Martin and, and Joe Ellis Monahan for inviting me here. I wish I could provide you with a my usual voice. I'm a bit hoarse today, but uh, Bill and Joe can tell you that yesterday I sounded worse. Um, anyway, it's it's a huge honor to to give this this virtual combinatorics colloquium and. I'm really honored to be considered a, uh, somebody in the Northeast. You know, I, I come from the Northeast originally, but now I think of myself as in the upper Midwest. So it's, it's good to return virtually anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be telling you about some counting things. Uh, my title is Cyclic Sieving, Old and New, and this is a topic that I and uh, some of my colleagues here at Minnesota, Dennis White, Dennis Stanton, have been involved with for you know, about 15 years almost. And uh, I, uh, let me just move to my outline. I'm gonna tell you what is cyclic sieving, what do I mean? Uh, so the definition, and uh, once we've gotten past that, I'm gonna just do a bunch of examples. <clears throat> and some of them are gonna be old examples, um, but they're, uh, they have a dual purpose. The, the first one I'm gonna show you is an old example that I think is, is beautiful, but it's really annoying. And uh, it's annoying because even though it's an example of what we're talking about, I feel like we don't understand it. And the more I advertise it, the more it might reach somebody who's thought about these things, which are alternating sign matrices. Um, I'll then move on to a, another old example, polygon triangulations, one of our first, um, which again, has an annoying feature. We feel like we don't understand it. and. I'm pretty sure it's related to clusters. So this is trying to reach out to the cluster people, and get your help to help us understand this. And I won't just talk about old examples. I'll, I'll move on to uh, a couple of new examples or an old example with a new twist. Let me try to annotate here. I should be pointing. Uh, yes. Spotlight. Here we go. I should be pointing to number four, the old example with a new twist, um, which will involve necklaces, and, and um, it's uh, something that one of my students, Eric Stuckey, has been working on. And if we have time, I'll talk about another newish example. It's one that's at least, uh, it's about a year old. And for those who were at FIPSAC last year, they may have heard Theo Duvropoulos talk about it, um, but for others, it, it may be new. So it's one that's joined my list of favorites. As I said on my poster, there's new examples that show up all the time, and I think, oh, that's a nice one, so I wanted to tell you about it. Okay, uh, any questions before we head on? Good. Yes, are we advancing? No, I have to stop annotating to advance, is that right? Stop annotating, advance. There we go. Okay. So uh, in telling you about what is cyclic sieving, I might fail completely. Um, and if I don't get it across, then I'm gonna recommend that you look at uh, one of these surveys about it. Um, there's several nice surveys. Bruce Sagan uh, wrote a beautiful survey. Uh, I didn't put the title of any of these, but 
you've got the authors in the year and they all have cyclic sitting in the title. So you can easily find them. Uh, Bruce is in surveys and combinatorics. There's another very nice survey. It's a little bit harder to get access to. It's in um, basically like uh, the Italian Math Society surveys. It's by Gian Giovanni Gaifi and uh, Alessandro Iracci. Um, that was in 2017. And then, of course, there's um, two things that the, the Dennis's and I, Dennis Stan and Dennis White and I wrote. Uh, one was a notices article that was called What is Cyclic Sieving? So it's short. That was in 2014. And then our original paper from 2004 just has a lot of examples in it and is a good So consult those if I fail here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Huh. I can't advance slides without turning off the annotation. Let me do that. So the definition is uh, from this 20, 20, 2004 paper that uh, Dennis's and I wrote. It says, uh, um, if we're given X, a finite set, we're thinking some set of combinatorial objects, and they're permuted by a cyclic group. Uh, so just think there's a, a cyclic group acting on them, permuting them. And uh, there's a polynomial, X of Q, that I think of as some Q analog for the cardinality of the set X. Then I'm going to say that this setup, this triple of X with the cyclic action of group C and this polynomial X of Q exhibits the cyclic sieving phenomenon. If for every D, when you take um, one of the elements of that cyclic group, so I, I named the generators of the cyclic group or generators little c, so the elements of the cyclic group are all the powers, c to the d. And if I want to know how many elements of x are fixed by a certain power, c to the d, of, of the generator, all I do is I go over to the polynomial, this q analog, x of q, and I plug in a complex root of unity, zeta to the d, that has exactly the same multiplicative order as the elements of my cyclic group. So the way you want to think of this is, you got your set X and it has some cyclic symmetry. Some elements have no symmetry, they're asymmetric. Some of them have more symmetry, two-fold symmetry, three-fold symmetry. If you want to count how many elements have a certain amount of symmetry, you just plug in a root of unity into that generating function, into the Q count X of Q. So I think of the X of Q is hiding the information about the cyclic symmetry or about the cyclic orbit structure in this action. Okay, and oof, I have to remember to unannotate each time, good. So uh, we had uh, discussed this in this paper from 2004, but we, there was a precursor, a very interesting thing that John Stembridge had talked about called the, the uh, Q equals negative one phenomenon. And that's just the case when your cyclic group has order two. So there's an involution, little c, so c squared is equal to one, and it's acting on your set. You have some order two symmetry on your set. And Stembridge in, back in 94 would say that you had a Q equals negative one phenomenon if you had a Q analog X of Q such that when you plug in Q equals one, it gives you the size of the set X. And when you plug in Q equals negative one, it gives you the number of elements fixed by the first, by that element, that involution. Okay, and it's exactly our setting when it's a cyclic group of order two. So some of the examples that I will show you have that kind of a uh, order two cyclic sieving phenomenon happening. Okay, so let's begin with uh, the first real example here, um, having to do with alternating side matrices. Are there any questions though before, uh, before we move on? Okay, so uh, this, uh, alternating sign matrices. These have a, a beautiful, illustrious history. They're, uh, you know, explained beautifully in the book by David Brassoon on proofs and, and confirmations. So they were defined in, in 1982 by Mills, Robbins, and Rumsey, and, an, and by an alternating sign matrix. It has entries that are zero, plus one, and minus one. And the entries uh, in each row and in each column, when you look at the non-zero entries, they have to alternate in signs. So they have to start with a plus somewhere in the row, then followed by a minus, plus, minus. It might be that there's only a single plus in the row, but if there's minuses, then they alternate with pluses. 
and it sums to plus one across each row and down each column. So that means it has to start with a plus one and end with a plus one. So here's an example of a six by six alternating sign matrix that I've, I've shown for you. And I'm gonna call ASM sub N is the set of all N by N alternating sign matrices. That's gonna be one of my combinatorial sets X. And let's say I wrote here at the bottom that the alternating sign matrices, they're in many ways, they, they beautifully generalize permutation matrices. So we should think of them as some more exotic form of permutation matrices. Okay. And so stop annotating. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Right. So what's the cyclic action? on the alternating sign matrices. It's a relatively small cyclic group and it's rotations by zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. So the fourfold rotations gives us a little cyclic group of order four. It's not hard to see from the definition that that will take an alternating sign matrix to another alternating sign matrix. And I've shown you for the alternating sign matrices of size three, what this cyclic orbit structure looks like. You get a, just a point, you get an orbit of size four. So that's what I would call a free orbit, an orbit in which the size of the orbit is the same as the size of the cyclic group. There's no stabilizer. You get an orbit of size two. So these two alternating sign matrices have a twofold symmetry. They're, uh, symmetric under 180 degree rotation. And there's one orbit of size one. This, this is the only alternating sign matrix which isn't a permutation matrix when you're looking at three by threes. And it has a lot of symmetry, therefore. It's fixed under 90 degree rotation, 180 degree rotation, and so on. Okay? So we want the, a cyclic sieving phenomenon to predict this sort of information. How many of the matrices will be fixed under 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and uh, 270 degree rotation. And so we do have such a thing. And that is, uh, yes, stop. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, I have to tell you that we do know how to count the alternating sign matrices, and it wasn't easy. So, how many alternating sign matrices are there of size n? There's a, a famous theorem that was conjectured by Mills, Robbins, and Rumsey in 1982 that the number of alternating sign matrices is some product of factorials over another product of factorials with equally many terms on the, the top and bottom. And uh, the factorials go one factorial, four factorial, seven factorial, so they jump by three on the top, and they start with n factorial, n plus one factorial, and, and go by one on the bottom. And uh, it, was, it took a while to prove. Doran Seilberger gave the, the first proof in 1992, and uh, then Greg Cooperberg came back and gave a, a different proof that connected it with statistical mechanics and physics. And uh, it's a, a beautiful story that I highly recommend reading uh, David Pursuit's book about this. But then beyond that story, we could ask this question I was just asking, which is how many of these alternating sign matrices are fixed under 180 degree rotation? They're called half turn, uh, sorry, half turn symmetric ASMs. And how many are fixed under 90 degree rotation? Those are usually called quarter turn symmetric ASMs. And there were formulas in the literature given by Cooperberg and by uh, Razumov and Stroganov dealing with various cases of what N was modulo four, that the formulas will depend upon what the congruence class of the size of the matrix mod four. And I'm not telling you those formulas on purpose because I don't need to. That's the point of the cyclic sieving phenomenon here. So there's a theorem that was checked by Dennis Stanton in 2004. It's, it's essentially unpublished, and I'll explain why in a moment. He, um, he checked that if you look at X being the, the n by n alternating sign matrices, C is this fourfold cyclic group, or the this cyclic group of order four acting by rotations. And we take, uh, let's point, we take this Q analog here, X of Q, is some way of turning those factorials into Q factorials. Some Q analog of the factorials is what you do to get your Q analog in this case. So in some sense, one of the most naive things that people ever do when they're trying to produce Q analogs. I take N factorial sub Q and uh, it's this, I'm defining it down here as 
1 sub q times 2 sub q times 3 sub q dot 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 times n sub q, where each of those terms I now have to define. The n sub q is a q analog of the number n, and it's just the geometric series, 1 plus q plus q squared up to q to the n minus 1. So when q goes to 1, this thing will turn into n. And uh, if you like, you can see uh, how to write it as a rational function. It's q to the n minus 1 divided by q minus 1. The point of writing it as a rational function here is that it shows that this expression up here, this x of q, it looks a priori like it might only be a rational function in q, a polynomial in q divided by a polynomial, but it will cancel. I'll explain why we know that later on. And if you go back to the beginning where I was defining the CSP, I actually asked that the q analog should be a polynomial in q, and, and this one is. Let me, oh, I'm, I'm annotating, so can't go back, but that's all right. I, this thing is a polynomial in Q. All right, let's not annotate. So, so what does Stanton's theorem say for the three by threes? How does it predict that orbit structure that we were talking about? Here's again, the, the picture of the orbits, these seven ASMs of size three that come in these three orbits. So what the, the cyclic sieving phenomenon, the CSP here should be saying, is that I take this polynomial in Q, notice I've actually written it out here, what those Q factorials were, what the quotient is. It cancels down to this quotient of Q numbers, but then that actually does cancel down to a polynomial in Q of, of degree eight in this case. And so it's no surprise that when we plug in Q equals one, we should be getting back the size of the set X. In terms of the way the, the CSP has been phrased, that's saying when we plug in zeta to the zero, so our fourth root of unity in this case, the cyclic group had order four, so I should always be plugging in fourth roots of unity. And if I plug in the fourth root of unity that's uh, zeta to the zero, namely one, I should just get the number of things that are fixed by the, the identity element of the cyclic action, which is just the size of the set X. So I do get seven. There's, this polynomial has seven terms, and so I get the seven elements, and I should be annotating. Let's annotate here. So when I plug in to this polynomial, which has seven terms, Q equals one, which is zeta to the zero, I get seven, which is just counting all seven elements of my set X. And that always happens, and it was no surprise in this case. But what's non-trivial here is that if I wanna know how many elements are fixed by the two-fold symmetry, I should plug in the power of zeta, zeta squared, which has multiplicative order two. So that's Q equals negative one. And if you plug in Q equals negative one here, you can quickly see you're gonna get three. You'll uh, you know, have, uh, what is it? How many terms are even? There's four even terms minus uh, two odd terms. No, that can't be right. Five even terms minus two odd terms, it gives three. So the, the point is that three is counting these three alternating sign matrices, which are fixed under 180 degree rotation. And then the last one is for the quarter turn ASMs, I should plug in a root of unity, zeta in this case, which is e to the two pi i over four, so it's just i, and I should plug in that root of unity that has order four, and it counts the alternating sign matrices that have fourfold symmetry. And there's only one of them, namely this one here, okay? So any, any questions about what the, the CSP is asserting? It's, it's asserting that this will always happen when we plug in these roots of unities, in, in roots of unity into this X of Q here as it gets larger. Could I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, do we know anything about, so for example, you've got some cancellation there in the Q equals minus one. You're going back to the Q equals minus one phenomenon. Uh, can we assert anything about the number of pairs that cancel? Is there a combinatorial statement about those? Well, somehow that when you say pairs, do you mean numerator and, oh, no, you mean pairs within the set. Yeah, a, a pairs of one and minus one canceled out, and then you got what was left, which survived, which counted the, the objects that are being counted by the CSP. Then you had a certain amount of cancellation. The question is, do we know anything about the amount of cancellation that went there? Does that say something about the object? Right, I'm trying to understand, when you say cancellation, do you mean additively these, these powers of Q, or do you mean cancellation of numerator and denominator? Which do you mean? 
I mean, canceling in the powers of Q. You had pairs of one and minus one, which when you add them, went away. And the survivors and uh, plus ones got you your... Um, right. Okay. So I think that, I mean, basically we can just, I, I think I can't say anything non-trivial. In other words, just based on how many things survive, we know how many pairs cancel. I, you know, in other words, we could subtract off the ones that didn't cancel and divide by two. So I don't think I have a non-trivial answer for you on that. Is that okay? Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So I, oh, I forgot to tell you something that's not annoying here. Let me, uh, before I tell you what's annoying about this one. One of the nice things about having um, a CSP, even if we don't think we understand why it happened, is that you'll notice it's easy for me to remember the formula X of Q. Let me uh, be pointing at things again. And so this formula X of Q, whoa, let me be pointing and not drawing, yes. This X of Q, it's, it's just as easy for me to remember that formula as it was to remember the original mills robbins rumsey conjecture formula. And once you have it, these root of unity evaluations, if it's a product formula, your X of Q, they're incredibly easy to do. So, of course, the Q equals one is just the same as the original, you know, you just take all the terms on top and cancel with terms on the bottom. It, when you plug in the Q equals negative one, essentially what you have to do is you look at like these seven, six, three, two, you ignore the terms that are not divisible by two in the, in the numerator and denominator. They tend to match up according to being in the same residue class, mod two. In other words, in this case, the odd terms match up in numerator and denominator. You just forget about those. And then when you had even terms like six and two, you just divide them through six over two. So this is how you do the Q equals negative one evaluation. And when you have product formulas, it always works like that. For example, this Q equals I, it's not illustrated so well, but none of the terms in the numerator or in the denominator were actually divisible by four. None of them were congruent to zero mod four. They all had residues which were either two mod four or three mod four, and those you just cancel down to ones. So when you have these, these nice Q formulas, which are products, actually getting the formulas that Razumov and Stroganov and Cooperberg had written in their papers are incredibly easy to derive from the Q formula. You really don't have to do any work at all. So that's a good thing about knowing that the CSP exist, exists. The bad thing though, what's, what's annoying here, I'm about to tell you is the proof, and that is, um, it's brute force. As I said, uh, we know how to easily do the evaluations of that product formula at one, negative one, and plus or minus i. And we had the answers already from Cooperberg and from Razumov and Stroganov. And so what Dennis did is he sat down and compared them and checked, yes, they were the same. This is, I'm not trying to malign Dennis. He would admit that this is why this is not a published paper of Dennis Stan. This is just, you know, something that's, it's in an REU report. In fact, he had REUs, you know, make sure that he hadn't made any mistakes in his, his check. Um, so it would be nicer to have uh, an insightful proof here. And so if I'm going to be complaining to you all the time about what's annoying, I should really tell you what it is that I want. And so I'd like to tell you what I mean by a good proof. Okay. Any, any questions before I show you what I mean by a good proof? All right, what I like better, a trace comparison proof. This is, this is my favorite. What I'd really like to have explaining a CSP in each case is a complex vector space. All right, let me uh, be annotating. I would like to have a complex vector space V with two different bases for that vector space, both of which are indexed by my combinatorial set X, in this case, the alternating sign matrices. But I would like them to have two different properties so that I can compute trace traces in these bases two different ways. I'd like the first basis, this V sub X basis, to be permuted by that cyclic group in exactly the way that the cyclic group permutes the set X. In other words, the basis element indexed by little x is sent to the basis element indexed by C of X, okay? The other basis, I would like to diagonalize the action of the cyclic group. So this, what I call the W of X basis, I would like the cyclic group to scale the W of X basis. 
So the generator of the cyclic group C takes Wx to some root of unity zeta to the some statistic on X times that basis element Wx. So they're eigenvectors. And it's a cyclic group, so this has to be acting by roots of unity, so they're powers of that primitive root of unity zeta. But I would like this statistic on X to actually be a statistic which gives me a Q generating function for the set X. In other words, I'd like X of Q to be the Q count of the set X with respect to that statistics, statistic that predicted the eigenvalues. If that's the case, then I claim you now do the trace computation of one of your elements in the cyclic group, C to the D, and its trace on V should be computable using either basis, the V of X basis or the W X basis, and you should get the same answer. If you use the V of X basis, you're gonna get the number of elements that are fixed by C to the D. You write down the permutation matrix, and the trace of a permutation matrix is the number of diagonal entries, it's the number of things that permutation fixes. So it's an easy calculation. Versus when you use this eigenvector basis, well, you should be summing up the eigenvalues. So you should be summing up uh, zeta to the D raised to the statistic X over all these basis elements. And that's basically your Q analog evaluated at Q is zeta to the D at the root of unity. So if you can just somehow magically produce these bases, you're, you're in business. It's, it's easy, right? But unfortunately, we don't know how to do it all the time. Any, any questions about that desired proof that we would love to have in all cases? Well, uh, not about the desired um, proof, but if you check your chat, there's a question from the audience. How do uh, I check my uh, chat? Well, I'll, I'll read. It just says, um, somebody asked if you get cyclic sieving for the full dihedral group acting on the ASMs. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So part of the problem with when you have dihedral, it's not clear what root of unity or what I should be plugging in to X of Q to model the number of fixed points for say the reflections in the dihedral group. We have things that seem like candidates, but I haven't quite phrased to my satisfaction a dihedral sieving phenomenon. We actually had some, some REU students uh, two summers ago who came up with a reasonable notion of what dihedral sieving might mean, but it wasn't exactly just plugging in roots of unity. So. Let me push that question off to this uh, uh, RU report that I could send you a link to to try and answer what I think of as dihedral sieving. Other questions? Okay. I stop annotating. Right. So here's, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a big complainer. I love to fetch. So what's even worse in the alternating sign matrix situation is that we don't even have a statistic stat of X for X as an alternating sign matrix, which correctly models that Q generating function. That Q generating function X of Q that Stanton was working with, we knew that it was a polynomial in Q, even with non-negative coefficients, because it was uh, the Q generating function for some other objects, this descending plane partitions. So, Andrews in 1979 had introduced these objects called descending plane partitions pi with parts less than or equal to n. And these are plane partitions of some kind. I won't even get into the definition. It's slightly complicated. But when you sum up their entries, that's the weight of the partition. And if you Q count them according to that statistic, you get the X of Q that Stanton was working with. So we knew it was a polynomial in Q uh, for something, but not for uh, you know, it's, it was a generating function for something, but it was not a Q generating function for statistics on alternating sign matrices. And as far as I know, that's a frustrating question for experts in that area still. It's, so this is part of the problem. Okay, enough fetching. Um, I'm about to move on to another example. Questions? Yes. I can't read that. Oh, and yes, I could if I actually clicked on it. Chat. Hmm, didn't show up. Joanne, can you read it? Uh, sorry, just a sec. Yes. Um, so the question was an easier question. Mm -hmm. If you restrict to ASMs with no minus ones, that is permutation matrices, is there a Q analog of N factorial that produces cyclic sieving for the 90 degree rotation? I believe the answer to that one is yes. Um, 
believe it's even better than that. I think we can even get a larger cyclic group that contains that cyclic group of order four. And I think it comes from the um, Maj minus exceedance polynomial that was uh, looked at by Sagan, Shreshin, and Wax. But I would have to check on that. I, I believe the answer is yes. Was there, were there two questions? Um, Maybe not. That was, the, that was the only one that came through just then. Okay, good. Let's annoy you with another old example. So this is one from our original paper. Um, it sure looks fun, uh, and yet again, we understand it somehow the wrong way. Here's a triple that exhibits the cyclic sieving phenomenon. The set X is going to be triangulations of an n plus two-sided polygon. So I've drawn an example with n equals six. It's an octagon, eight sides. And we act by the obvious cyclic group, which is just rotation. You rotate the polygon, it rotates the triangulation. These are triangulations which don't introduce any internal vertices. They only use vertices around the boundary. And my Q analog X of Q is uh, McMahon's Q Catalan polynomial. It's one over n plus one sub Q is our, our same Q analog from before. And this two n choose n sub Q is a Q binomial coefficient, where in general, Q binomial coefficient n choose K sub Q is n factorial sub Q divided by K factorial sub Q divided by n minus K factorial sub Q. Okay, and so yes, this will exhibit a, a cyclic sieving phenomenon and um, let me stop annotating so I can advance the page. And so I've just illustrated it here, what's going on when you have uh, the hexagon. So this would be n equals four. It is a cyclic group of order six. So you have to plug in sixth roots of unity into this polynomial that you see there, which is, um, you know, getting reasonably large. And uh, you, you shouldn't be too surprised that if you plug in Q equals one, which is zeta to the zero, you're gonna get 14, the Catalan number, which counts all of these triangulations. But if you plug in Q equals negative one, which is zeta cubed, you're gonna get the ones which are fixed under uh, doing the rotation, the smallest rotation three times, which is 180 degree rotation, so two-fold symmetry. So that's at Q equals negative one. And when you plug in Q equals zeta squared, you're, you're plugging in a root of unity that has order three, you get the ones that are, excuse me, you're plugging, yes, the ones that have order three. You're plugging in a root of unity that has order three, and you're counting these two triangulations which have uh, symmetry under uh, order three rotation. Okay, and then you could also plug in uh, zeta itself. There are no triangulations which are fixed under uh, six-fold rotation, under two pi over six rotation. Nobody's fixed, so you do get zero, okay? And so it, it sure looks nice. Um, I wish I understood it. We only know a brute force proof. Um, the one that was in our original paper. Uh, and what's even more annoying about this one, and, and the reason I want to re reach out to many of you, is that there are two ways in which this one needs a cluster algebra proof. We know so much more about cluster algebras than we did you know, in 2000 or 2004. And let me tell you one of the ways in which this one, this one seems to generalize to clusters. So um, there are two uh, Taiwanese mathematicians, Sen Peng Yo and Tung Shan Fu, in 2006, they generalized this. And I'm gonna say some words that are just to set up some numerology, but don't worry about these words. If you've never seen them, this is uh, you know, the subject of another virtual talk. Um, I'm gonna talk about finite, a finite real reflection group W, and you should be thinking the previous case was when W is the symmetric group. I need some numbers, the degrees of W, D1 less than or equal to D2 up to, up to Dn. These are the degrees of the basic invariant polynomials when W acts on a polynomial ring. Don't worry about it if you've never seen that. You call the biggest degree, Dn, you call it H, the Coxeter number, and you'll always get a CSP triple, triple, these guys checked, when you let X be the W clusters. So for people who know cluster algebra theory, there's the cluster fan, so these would be like the chambers in the cluster fan. If your real reflection group wasn't crystallographic, these would be Nathan Reading's uh, chambers in his Cambrian fan. And there's an, a cyclic action in that setting that comes from Fomin and Zelovinsky's deformed Coxeter elements. So there's 
somebody hanging around there, who I'm gonna call it tau here, and it has order H plus two, where H was that Coxeter number. It's a cyclic action of that order on these clusters. And there is an X sub Q, which is called a WQ Catalan polynomial. Oh, let me be pointing here. So this X of Q, which is some quotient of a bunch of Q numbers divided by a bunch of other Q numbers that came from those degrees in that H. You take the degrees on the bottom as Q numbers, you shift them up by H, H plus the degrees on the top. And this is some well-known, well-established by now Q analog of a, a Catalan number. It's a polynomial in Q always, and that's not an obvious thing. And it will always do a, a more general CSP like the polygon triangulations. So that means there should be a cluster proof, but we don't have one. So get on it. And here's another one that suggests there should be a cluster proof. There is a tantalizingly close, but not quite the same CSP that was proved by Brendan Rhodes in 2010. Here, instead of polygon triangulations, we do multi-dissections using a fixed number of edges, K edges. So what do I mean by that? Now I'm just gonna use an N gon, not an N plus two gon. So I've drawn a picture here with N equals eight. So there's an octagon underlying this story. And K is 13. 13 is the number of edges you see here counted with multiplicity. There should be, you're allowed to have multiple copies of the edges of, you know, which are boundary edges or diagonals across the middle in this N gon. And you just don't want them to be crossing each other so that they dissect the N gon but you don't have to use an edge. You might have missed some edges like this boundary edge here. That's okay. But you fix the number of edges. You fix, you look at the number of multi-dissections with that fixed number of edges. You still let the cyclic group be the same rotations. And then there's a Q analog, which again has a product formula, but I've written it here as uh, a principally specialized Schur function for the shape, which is two by K, a rectangular two by K. These are actually something pretty close to Q Catalans. They're called the Q Nariana polynomials. And I could have written down a product formula, but I didn't bother to do that. Here, Rhodes was able to prove it using that trace comparison. So what he comes up with is a model for a vector space. In this case, the vector space is the kth graded component of the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian of two planes in the N space. It's well known that that thing has a cluster monomial basis. So cluster theory, this is one of the first examples of an important cluster algebra is exactly this, this coordinate ring. So if you look at the cluster monomials of degree K, they give you one basis that's permuted by some element that, that uh, Rhodes writes down. And then on the other hand, there's an eigenvector basis, a weight basis, which would be just any of our usual semi-standard tableau bases for uh, these coordinate rings, which are realizing the irreducible representations of GL2C. So there's, there's some fancy stuff going on there, but don't worry about it. The point is, this seems so, so close, and it has a good proof, and it involves clusters, and yet neither I nor Brendan nor anybody that I've talked to knows how to deduce the original one from this one. So please, please tell me how to do that. A any questions from those of you who are gonna tell me how to do that? All right, you worked fast enough. We're moving on. Yeah, the silence is overwhelming, and it's not because <laughs> yeah, exactly. I left the mics muted. <laughs> Very good. Okay, I need to tell you about an old example with a new twist. So, this is one that. Uh, sorry? I can speak now? Okay. Is, Vic, can somebody you hear with me? a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the phenomenon for the triangulation of uh, the um, N-GON. Yes. Uh, do you have uh, results for other Catalan objects? Like dig paths or something like this? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, yes. So, Eli, there's also the um, the one that has to do with a uh, standard young tableau of a uh, two by n shape, and that's what is the action in the in that case? Yeah, so if I say it as two by n standard tableau, the action would be promotion, 
but on dick paths um i think that it essentially ends up being um like a rotation so or certainly if we do non-crossing matchings of two end points around a circle it corresponds to rotating the two end points so so there's so there there's definitely some other way to so is there any canoni canonical way to pass from one Catalan object to, to the other? <clears throat> Not that yeah, I'm aware. One of the bijections? Yeah, I, only a few of them. I don't think there's any canonical way. I think in, in certain specific cases, there are ways to do it, but uh, not in general. Okay, so every case is interesting uh, by itself. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's, let's try something old with a new twist. I want to rethink that uh, McMahon Q Catalan. So let me point to it here. In, excuse me, instead of the formula that I originally gave to you, 1 over n plus 1, 2n choose n with q's on it, you can rewrite it. There's a, a standard way to rewrite the Catalan as 1 over 2n plus 1, 2n plus 1, choose n and you can stick cues on it and it still works. It's a valid rewriting. And then one sees that it's a special case of something that's been considered uh, recently quite a bit, these rational Q Catalans. So if you uh, look at A and B being positive integers that are relatively prime, then one over A plus B sub Q times A plus B choose A sub Q, that turns out to be a polynomial in Q called a rational Q Catalan number, the AB Q Catalan number. And it's been considered by many people, by Drew Armstrong, Brendan Rhodes, Nathan Williams, Armstrong, Nick Lohr, uh, uh, Greg Warrington, and also uh, Michelle Bodnar and, and Brendan Rhodes, and, and other people have, have looked at its properties. And when you, it does generalize the, the McMahon Q Catalan when you take A to be N and B to be N plus one. Certainly those are relatively prime and you can check, it'll, it'll go back. But more generally, what one can do is for any composition alpha, this says alpha is alpha one, alpha two, up through alpha L. So those are positive integers. And I want them to be a composition of the number N. So they sum to the number N. If their parts are uh, relatively prime, if the GCD of the parts of alpha is one, then it's not too hard to check again. And I'm gonna be giving you an argument for this that what I'm calling C alpha sub Q. So it's one over N sub Q and then the multinomial, Q multinomial, N choose alpha. So that's one over N sub Q, N choose alpha one, alpha two, up through alpha L sub Q. And this is just defined with the factorial sub Q in the usual way you would expect. It's the, the obvious way to Qify. This thing turns out to have, uh, to be a polynomial in Q with integer coefficients. In fact, with non-negative integer coefficients. But let me tell you, one way that we knew that it was a polynomial in Q. Whoops, stop annotating. Okay. So why is this thing uh, a polynomial in Q? Well, it's because if I just took the Q multinomial, X of Q to be the N choose alpha one, alpha two, dot, 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 that thing was part of a CSP that was in the original paper that we wrote with the Dennis's. So it, there, that X sub Q, the Q multinomial, was one of our first examples. It was counting, at Q equals one, it counts words that have alpha one ones, alpha two twos, alpha three threes, et cetera. So words of length N, which alpha I tells you how many times you use the, the letter I. So if you like, it's multi-set permutations with a fixed multiplicities alpha on your elements of the multiset. Then you have a cyclic action of Z mod NZ, where N was the length of the word, the total number of letters. So the, the number that alpha was a composition of, just cycling positions. So you take your words and you, I've, I've written it here, you take the word W1, W2 up to WN, and you move the last letter at the bit to the beginning and shift everybody over by one. So you, you cycle the words. And so we proved that in general, this triple, that set X, that cyclic group, and this Q analog, this multinomial coefficient would give a CSP always, whether or not the GCD condition was there. That, that meat was irrelevant. But when the GCD condition is there, if the parts of alpha are one, 
it's not too hard to see you can't have any words with symmetry. No words can have cyclic symmetry because the letters would have to be equally distributed and the GCD of the letter multiplicities is one. So if you think about it, this cyclic group action is free. And since there was a CSP, that means that a bunch of root of unity evaluations for that multinomial coefficient, it must vanish when you plug in any nth root of unity, which is not one. So a Q equals one, it gives you a multinomial coefficient as a number. But for all the other nth roots of unity, it has to vanish, which means it's divisible by the product of Q minus all the other nth roots of unity, and that's N sub Q. It's the thing that we were trying to show the divisibility of. Okay, so that was an argument using a CSP for why this thing was a polynomial in Q. And now I'm gonna tell you that this thing does some cyclic sieving still after you divide. Oh, before I do that, I have to tell you what objects. Okay, so after you divide by n, I claim if we have our GCD condition, then the C alpha sub Q should be counting the C orbits, right? I said it was a free action of a group of size n, so the number of orbits should be obtained by taking the size of the set dividing by n. So one over n and then the multinomial n choose alpha is counting the alpha necklaces. Necklaces would be cyclic orbits for your z mod nz cycling the words. I've, I've shown an example here, let me be pointing at it, in which alpha is three comma four, I should have made that a red three and a blue four. So when I take my words that have three red letters and four blue letters, and I look at their cyclic equivalence classes, I'm gonna call those three, four necklaces, okay? Alpha necklaces, three reds, four blues. And there should be one over seven, seven choose three of them, because I began with seven choose three words, and I just divided by seven because it was a, a free action of a cyclic group of size seven, okay? And that's gonna be my set X, is the necklaces. So we're gonna get, Oh yes, I need to tell you some group that's acting on the necklaces. It looks like I got rid of the cyclic group action. What kind of a cyclic group should be acting? Well, now it's the reflection that somebody brought up earlier. So what's true is you still have on your necklaces, oop, I did the wrong thing. On your necklaces, you still have the ability to reflect a necklace across any symmetry line. And it gives you another necklace. And sometimes you go back to the same necklace because the necklace already had a reflection symmetry. And sometimes you're not fixed. You have a, an orbit of size two. So this is a situation where you might ask for a Q equals negative one phenomenon. And indeed there is one. So my current student, Eric Stuckey, he recently proved that whenever the GCD of the alphas is one, you get a Q equals negative one phen phenomenon for these alpha necklaces with this order two action of reflection by tau that I'm showing you. And where the Y sub Q is this generalization of the Q Catalan number and the rational Q Catalan number, this one over N sub Q, N choose alpha sub Q. And this one has an interesting proof and it, it generalizes. So let me say what's, what's interesting here. Oh, let me, before I do that, do an example. So in our case, we had these five necklaces. They had some non-trivial tau actions. Some of them were acted on trivially. And here's my, my one over seven sub Q, seven choose three sub Q. This is actually a Q Catalan. This is one of these Catalan cases. This is the Q Catalan that at Q equals one gives us back five, the size of the set. But here at Q equals negative one, you can see you'll get uh, three is your evaluation. And so it's counting the three of them that were fixed, the three necklaces that had reflection symmetry. Okay, questions on that? All right, let me advance, Oops, stop annotating. So the proof that Eric Stuckey gives is interesting. Um, it uses Moline's theorem from invariant theory, okay, which is some way of writing down Hilbert series for invariant rings when finite groups act on polynomials. And the reason this comes up is because it's not just about necklaces. It it's generalizes quite a bit further. So. I told you a story in which we began with these alpha words, words that had a fixed number of letters of each color, and we put on this GCD condition 
so that the cyclic group would act freely. And then we got this Q equals negative one, one phenomenon when we took the C orbits, the set Y, which was the alpha necklaces. So the way this generalizes is the alpha words turn into more generally cosets of the symmetric group SN uh, by a subgroup H such that the action of the N cycle on the other side of the cosets. So these are cosets where H is on the right. You let the cyclic group generated by an N cycle act on, a le on the left. And if that action is free, then we know how to write down a Q analog of X that will be divisible by N sub Q because we know of a, a Q, excuse me, a CSP in that situation. We divide by the N sub Q and we get uh, a uh, CSP now, or Stuckey proves a CSP for the double cosets. So the C orbits of the cosets that have H on the right. And the leftover action, the thing that plays the role of tau, is elements in the symmetric group that normalize the N cycle. So things which are in the normalizer of the, the permutation, one goes to two goes to N goes to one. So I like this one. It's not exactly a, a trace comparison proof, although it's related and uh, it's quite interesting. I think what I'm gonna do is not tell you about this, this other new one, which uh, Theo Diveropoulos talked about at uh, FIPSAC last year. If you wanna hear about it, I, I love it a lot. I, I really like it. Um, but you could go to the FIPSAC 2017 uh, abstract and look up Diveropoulos. I think, I believe that would be the longest Greek name you're gonna find in the list of authors. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, so you're allowed to unmute to, to applaud. <laughs> so, yeah. but anyhow, thank you very much. Uh, and, and in general, feel free to um, unmute and um, turn your videos on. We can chat a little bit, talk to, Bill, to, uh, talk to Vic and um, see if there's any questions. Any questions? I'm hearing something. Okay, uh, you got to speak up a little bit, though. Well, I, I as an I, as a non-expert, uh, I'm wondering what's uh, special about the cyclic group. Uh, I, I see that you know you, you have some ideas that the hedral group might also um, might also uh, allow for some kind of counting trick like this. What about a product of cyclic groups? Or, or, um, or so, something also quite a, an abelian group, let's say a finite abelian group. Right, so definitely for finite abelian groups, we know what we want and there are good examples around. So um, one of the, the papers where, where we wrote about this is uh, with Ellen Barcelo and Dennis Stanton, it's called the uh, Bi-Mahonian Distributions. And there we had a, a bicyclic sibling phenomenon, which was a product of two cyclic groups, Bill. And then um, there's, there's been others. So for example, um, Andy Berget and Jia Huang have a paper in which they look at a direct product of, of cyclic groups, so a finite abelian group. They find some interesting examples. And uh, so definitely for finite abelian groups, we know exactly what we want to happen and there are some interesting examples. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for, um, for Vic this evening? Yeah. All right. Um, well, Bill, um, Bill, are you there? We're set with the recording. I'll stop recording. Well, or, yeah. So, um, well, anyhow, thank you all very much. Keep your eye out for further talks. Um, but let's thank Vic again for this really great one. Thank you, Vic. Um, if